Hey builders, this is Brian Gardner, developer advocate at WP Engine. Today, I'm gonna to walk through how and why you should build a base WordPress theme. This is a great thing for agencies and freelancers who are looking to find a boilerplate to do all their work from. Let's get started. Okay, here we are. So the new title, the newly revised title is how to and why you should build a base WordPress theme. So this is different than forking. Um, in a sense, it's sort of six to one, half dozen to another. We kind of talked internally about what was the better way to say this. Uh, you can build a base theme by way of forking. You can fork a WordPress theme to build a base theme. So it really does go sort of both ways. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to do it with Frost in particular. Um, and so the first few slides will be a little bit of a recap of the last workshop we did just to set some context. Uh, the one thing that's different, though, is Frost officially released version 1.0 earlier this week on GitHub. If you go to the frostwp.com website and click on download theme in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you can get the latest version of Frost. It has been submitted to the WordPress.org repository. Uh, we're playing the name game uh, over there, so I'm working with Otto and uh, Kafle to help get this onto the WordPress theme directory. Uh, so that will also be... Uh, hopefully coming soon. That being said, uh, Frost version 1.0 introduces a new color palette, which you can see here. I talked about this last time. I wanted to put together a cohesive color unit um, for a couple of reasons. One I'll get to in a short bit. Uh, all of these colors pass the contrast accessibility test. And I think Sam may have the link handy from last time. Uh, this presentation I did locally on local, our tool, uh, the last one I put onto the Frost website. And so some of these slides have these links where you could click onto each color and see that that color passes the accessibility test. Uh, so Frost 1.0 introduces new colors, which is fun. Uh, blue made sense in the spirit of uh, hydration, winter, and so forth. And so that's coming. Uh, along with Frost version 1.0 comes uh, a slew of theme patterns that are now uh, available. Um, and this is the interesting part and part of the reason why we're going to fork a theme. So Frost has mm, 30 or 40 patterns, several headers, footers, featured sections called the actions and things like that uh, included in it. It's really meant to help people get themselves familiar with full site editing and starting to build with patterns. And so also, if you go to the Frost website, there's a patterns tab up here and you can kind of click through and see all of the various patterns that come with Frost. There will be come... Uh, an increasing number of them as sort of time iterates, but for the meantime, there's a bunch to start from. So in addition to patterns, uh, one of the good things about Frost is that it is sort of baked in responsiveness, uh, both with spacing and typography. And so uh, once again, going to the Frost website, if you go to the styles link, you can see here fluid spacing, fluid typography. Uh, this is all set up using sort of the clamp system, which basically adjusts on mobile devices, uh, the padding and margin controls and typography is a similar setup. And you can kind of take your screen and um, go back and forth and just watch how that responds. So this is a little bit of an overview from last time, but I thought it would help set context. Uh, in addition, uh, Frost is on GitHub. So if you want to contribute to Frost or report an issue, you can. Uh, additionally, it can be used to fork the theme to go do whatever you want to as well. Uh, in fact, I believe there are several people who have forked it. Maybe I can't even remember the last, looking at this screenshot, which was sent out recent, 77 forks of it. So uh, people are definitely forking it on GitHub, doing with it what they please. And that is completely the intent of the theme. So as I mentioned, uh, Part of the plan was to submit Frost to the repo or give it to the community so that they could do things like we're going to talk about today. Uh, so different from last time is a little green check mark. Like I said, that is now uh, in the hands of the folks at the theme review team. And hopefully within the next few days, we'll hear uh, the status of that. Okay, so reasons why, uh, fast forwarding into this, uh, actually, before I start, uh, does anybody have any questions kind of just as the sort of overview of Frost 1.0? I want to kind of make sure we have time um, along the way. And since I'm sharing my screen, Sam, I can't see the chat. So if there's anything that you see or uh, want to bring up for me, please do so and just interrupt. And I'll go ahead and answer that before I get going. If not, no big deal. There is one question. I'm not sure if we're going to address it, though. So I'll just ask it now. It's from Lisa. 
Snyder, she said, Mm -hmm. is it better to use a basic theme for creating a base theme? Frost sounds like it's got great options and patterns built in. I'm not sure how basic theme is defined, but if you have an an answer for that. Uh, That'll be part of the presentation. So I will get to that uh, shortly. Okay. Perfect. That's Uh, all I see. Cool. Thanks. Uh, So reasons why somebody would want to build a base theme or fork a theme, we're kind of interchangeably going to refer to it. Uh, There are four here listed. Uh, All of these will be on a piece that we publish on the WPEngine.com slash builders website. Uh, That piece will be coming out soon. Um, But this is sort of an abbreviated version. Um, So you can see, I'll just read through them just for those who are maybe out and about and can't see the screen. Uh, So the first one is enhanced efficiency. It allows builders and teams to optimize the development process by including the features and functionalities required for clients, delivering websites more quickly and cost-effectively. Number two, unparalleled customization. Builders can provide clients with a unique experience, making modifications and tailor the design to client needs, ensuring the websites are distinct and tailored to the client's brand once again. Uh, Future-proof flexibility. A builder can update and keep its code base current. That is one of the most important things, better serving clients. Uh, This lets them stay on top of web design trends, providing clients with tailored cutting edge solutions. This one is big because, and we talk about this a lot. uh, In fact, last week, uh, or maybe the week before on Buildman, we talked about the idea of sort of leveraging somebody else's software. Uh, For instance, like building a child theme off of a theme that you don't control and sort of uh, the inherent risks. Obviously, there's some benefits that you don't have to be the one who keeps up that main code base, but you're also subject to its changes and pivots. Uh, And so in this case, um, and why, and I'll get to Lisa, your question here very soon, um, why forking a theme and making it sort of your own starter theme or like a boilerplate for your, whatever, however you choose to use it is good because then sort of you control your destiny. Uh, and, and with that comes the intellectual property, a uh, little bit less about the legalities of the code. You don't necessarily own the code because it's uh, WordPress is GPL, which I'll get to as well. But really, ownership of the creative elements fosters stronger brand identity. In the case of Frost, everyone recognizes the mountains and the colors, and it kind of has sort of this, you know, intellectual property that's sort of assimilated with it. And so as you use your own thing, you can sort of inherit some of those benefits. Um, And it facilitates long-term success for builders. Uh, In your case, it also provides a sense of exclusivity, further contributing to the competitive edge. In other words, if you go to a client, I have my own base theme. I build everything off of this solid code base. That would be something that as a client, I might want to hear saying, this is an established piece of software. Uh, it's been thoroughly tested and so on. And so uh, that would be another reason. Uh, okay, let's get to the legal part of it. Open source, it's completely legal to fork a WordPress theme. In fact, that's how I got started. Uh, back in 2006, I found a theme called Pool. P-O-O-L by Borgia Fernandez, and I forked it. And from that came the first revolution theme, uh, the evolution into Studio Press, the Genesis framework, and everything that came from all of that was through forking. And of course, WordPress itself was forked from B2. Mike Little and Matt Mullenweg forked the software we use. And so the beauty of open source is that it's completely legal to fork. Um, I'll read just sort of the sort of the fine print for again, those who can't View the GPL, the general public license, is a free open source software license used by WordPress and many other software applications. WordPress is released under the GPL, meaning anyone can use, modify, and distribute the code if their modifications are available under the same license. That's the important thing. If you fork a theme, you can't then say uh, it's no longer GPL, right? Because that just is not the intent of the license. And so um, by adopting sort of this ideology, you're also sort of joining the pay it forward community where uh, anybody else, if you make it public can fork the work that you've done and that's part of the game. Uh, Like I said, it's great course of action for builders. And so I will get here. uh, And before I go to step one, this is gonna actually be the part where I start to show you how to fork a theme. Uh, I do wanna um, address Lisa's question, but also wanted to make sure before I started, if there was any questions additionally, uh, from what I just came from. So there was Lisa's question. And then I think there was a kind of a follow-up to that too, which is, did you create Frost originally to be used Mm -hmm. as a base theme? So just conversation around that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I'll start with that question and then get to Lisa's. So two years ago, I created Frost mainly as a, 
a, a base theme from a visual wireframe standpoint. And by that, I mean, most of the patterns in Frost and still for the most part are very generic black and white. One, it's the aesthetic I like to design in, but also it just, it's unopinionated and allows people to do what, what they want. Sort of, as you think of like mocking up and wireframing and like Figma and things like that, uh, it was really meant to be sort of a tool like that. The problem with Frost, uh, and this is Lisa, I'm gonna get to your question here. The problem with Frost was that as I added more patterns, it got heavier and more bloated and just, um, which is great for people who want to play around. And it was up until version 1.0 uh, experimental. It really was our tool at developer relations here at WP Engine to showcase full site editing. And so naturally it just made sense to just add more patterns to just show more ways it can be used. I personally, when I started playing around with um, my own projects, my personal site, other things I wanted to do, I would obviously have used Frost, but what I stopped wanting to do was going into Frost and removing everything in it because the application I wanted to use it for didn't require all that stuff. And so the first thing I literally did in every project, and we'll, I'll show you here in a second, is I literally opened up the patterns directory and just basically wiped it clean because I didn't need any of them. And so from that perspective, um, what I'm going to walk through here is sort of an example of how you can uh, take Frost, fork it down to like its basic sort of bare bones, and then develop on top of that yourself. So, uh, and it's really not all that difficult as we'll kind of walk through here. So um, Sam, can you repeat Lisa's question verbatim? So I just make sure I hit the right spot of, of what, she, what I think she's trying to get at. Yep. So there's two questions. Is it better to use a basic theme for creating a base theme? And then did you create Frost originally to be used as a base theme? Okay. So uh, I did not, I did not make Frost to become a base theme. I, well, let's just be candid. I forked Frost myself and developed a theme called Powder, which is my own personal base theme. So that is a stripped down version of Frost, literally took Frost, went through the steps I'm about to go through here, and then started with that as like the Brian Gardner personal theme that I'm going to do for anything I want to do. Cause I just, I get, like I said, um, I didn't want to just go through all the hassle of like doing all the deletes before I started every project. So I just put it all into one base theme, made it my own, which is also available on the repo. Uh, much of the code base and powder, it comes from frost and vice versa. I've sent things back and forth. So, um, so I hope that answers the question. So someone would fork frost to make their own base theme, which is exactly what we're showing here. Yes, 100%. Now you could use Frost and leave it as is and build on top of it um, for whatever reason you want to do that. That's totally fine also. Um, but what I, I'm an advocate of people, agencies, um, freelancers, and even product builders. If, if you're going to like do something sort of continual or like repeatedly, uh, and you don't mind rolling up your sleeves and sort of getting through like the nuts and bolts of how WordPress and themes and all of this works, it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to then feel confident with what you're building. And like I said, maybe there's an update to Frost that adds 30 more patterns that you don't want to inherit every time we do something like that. By forking a theme, you have your own. And I'm looking at uh, Christopher Harris, who I know builds websites for churches. And so this, so for instance, forking Frost and having a theme called, I don't know, <laughs> trying to think of a, a, a church word off the top of my head. Um, worship, you know, the worship framework or whatever he wants to call it. Um, that this would be a use case where he would take Frost, fork it, call it worship, make it his own little internal thing, uh, and then just build all of his sites off of that. Now, similarly, uh, in the same way that Frost was built, as I followed along the development of Gutenberg, um, one thing people can and should do if they do fork Frost is periodically just check in to the Frost GitHub to see things that are changing. Like maybe there's new methodologies in WordPress that Frost takes advantage of. It's a great way to learn, to sort of see like an isolated, replace this with that feature. Um, WordPress ships something new in WordPress core. Frost takes advantage of it because you're not dependent on Frost. You don't have access to that unless you go look for it. So um, just, I would say fork Frost, keep an eye on GitHub to see new commits that come through, to see if these are changes that impact what you're doing. And if they're ways in which you could make your theme better also. Awesome segue, because another question here that I think is related says, are you then the developer of the new theme and then have to be responsible for maintaining and keeping it updated? Uh, yes. Now, 
and, and even if that, even if Frost were never to have been submitted to the repository, if you download Frost and then put it on a client site, that's still your responsibility. You're the one who's sort of fostering and inheriting uh, the risk. It's the tool you're choosing to use. And so therefore, if something breaks on a client site, can't come back to Frost and say, oh, Frost did it wrong, or I don't like the way it worked, or I implemented it poorly, it's it's your fault. So it's kind of the way software works. Um, but again, I look at it more from the beauty of it empowers you to like do things and make choices and and sort of use that as your value add. Uh, if I'm looking for a church website and I go to Christopher's website and he says, hey, pick any of these other themes that I didn't develop and I'll implement it for you. Like there's an insinuation there that, well, this guy's not quite legit or he's not professional or he's using other people's things. Now, if Christopher says, hey, I've got the worship framework in which I build and leverage all of the modern WordPress tools and I've got custom plugins built into it, all of a sudden that seems like a, very, a valuable service that I want to be a part of. So. That makes sense. Thanks, Brian. Um, yep. Related. This is another question. This is perfect because this is in the why. Why fork? Yep. Uh, why fork a theme? Yep. Um, there's a clarification, but there are no like check for updates or auto updates that happen because you're forking the theme. Uh, correct. As long as, uh, well, for starters, if the theme isn't on the repo to begin with, likely there that's not going to be the case anyways. Um, because usually, you know, with a few exceptions, people using EDD and licensing and stuff like that, there really is no update check other than up against the WordPress.org theme directory. When Frost gets there, uh, um, if you leave it named Frost, first of all, you're not forking it at that point, then yes, those updates will occur, right? Like if you took Frost and just put it on a client site, didn't change the name, tweaked a few colors, and then called it your own, um, not name-wise, but then uh, Frost being an active theme somewhere and there was an updated version, that client will see the update to Frost. So it's another reason to sort of circumvent that um, to kind of get rid of that update nag is to fork it. Uh, assuming you choose a name that's not another theme on the directory, which has happened from time to time. Um, in other words, if you call it something else and that theme name happens to be used on a different as a different theme on the repo, there could be like a false negative update where then somebody else's theme overrides your theme. So just be careful, I guess is kind of the bottom line. Thank you. And then I think this is one last question around this topic. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, if you're stripping down Frost, um, should would it make more sense for people to fork something like Powder since it's the more uh, basic version of it? Or, you know, just, I think that's just the question overall. That is... Uh... The choice of the user. Um, obviously, you know, we just want people to embrace full site editing. In other words, for people who don't want to actually have to do what I'm about to show and they just want to grab a theme and then run with it, Powder is a great theme to do that with um, because I've done the work for you by stripping it all out. Um, I don't think there's anything in one and not the other. Like, in other words, anything that basically has happened within WordPress, especially with 6.2. I mean, update, they're both equally up to date as possible. So um, that being said, uh, yes, the answer could be take powder as sort of a shortcut um, or take frost, learn how to do it. Uh, that works as well too. Perfect. And this, this, like you said before, applies to any WordPress theme. Um, uh, yeah. Which you could, you're showing. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, for the most part, there might be a couple of like nuances that might be different from theme to theme, but generally speaking, Yes, anything that's on the WordPress.org directory, you can fork. It's it's there. It's part of WordPress's community of themes. Uh, it's just going to demonstrate Frost because it's ours here, WP Engine, and so on. So you could go fork 2023. You can go find a Rich Tabor theme and fork it, or Andrews Norin, or I think uh, Mike McAllister, who's on this call, he's also on uh, with us at WP Engine. His theme is on its way to the repo, uh, his Ollie theme. O-L-L-I-E, uh, owed to the 80s and 90s skaters that we used to be. So that'll also be on the repo, which you can fork. So if it's on the repo, you don't need to ask about forking it. Awesome. Brian, do we have a chance for one more question related to this before you jump in? Okay. Um, why fork instead of creating a child theme? That's a great question. And it, it's an interesting question I'm going to have to answer because as part of Powder, I'm creating a child theme thing. And so in one context, um, 
if you okay so let me back up because a lot of this sort of hinges around like the genesis sort of methodologies that we set forth years ago um building a theme for a client on top of another theme in other words like if you said i'm just going to create a child theme of frost to, to tweak a few colors um puts you somewhat at risk again that frost updates something that you don't intend for your client to have and so uh, first of all it'll trigger the update nag to the client in the back end. And so you'll always run the risk of them pushing a button that they're not supposed to push. Um, but it, it's part of the ownership and, and control. And when I say that, I mean it in a good way that um, you and your client have like something that's between the two of you and you're the one sort of the gatekeeper of that that theme and that code. Um, now, if you're less savvy, don't know how to, don't want to fork a theme, um, sure. You know, if you find a trusted theme that you trust and rely on, you know, the developers and you know, you're just trying to add a little value on top of that, maybe as your service, that would be a case for doing that. Um, and this, and I'll, I'll actually answer this question here just to help under, people understand. In my case, um, the way WordPress works now is full site editing and the site editor really empowers people to build things through the back end, right? The dashboard through the site editor experience. Like you could take a blank theme like Frost or Powder and turn it into basically anything you want with some exceptions, um, users, end users, that is people who are sort of like the B2C in the market, they're not capable of doing that work. And so the child theme system works in the sense of that's a developer's opportunity to package something that's consumable out of the box. That makes sense. I'll use Christopher again as an analogy. If he wants to sell church themes that have like uh, its own set of patterns and you know all of that, he would probably have his base theme and build his, you know, maybe he's got five different themes or like arrangements or layouts or whatever that he wants to sell. Um, he would have his own base theme and child themes because then somebody could buy it, install it, and it'll work in the way in which like a demo site is set up. The templates are laid out the way they're supposed to be, the color schemes and all of that. That's kind of the case for, um, sure, all of those child themes could essentially be made by sort of working your way through it in the back end, but a consumer can't do that. So it's like you're prepackaging sort of an arrangement and a style and a design for someone to consume like out of the box. And that's why uh, I choose child theme because like, I don't wanna have to, if there's like a common piece of code and this was why we built Genesis to begin with, I didn't wanna have to update the same thing in like 10 different themes. So I don't know if that answers, I hope that answers the question. I'm trying to, to play both sides of the field because depending on the use case, Sam, you say many ways to WordPress, um, it's true. And so there's different sort of circumstances that might require you to do it differently. Perfect. Thanks for answering that, Brian. Um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Cool. All right. So this is how to successfully fork a theme. Um, so step one, and I'm going to toggle between sort of my slideshow and then my desktop, which will, which will allow you to see what I'm actually doing. Uh, so I have a theme on my local uh, install and I, I, I'm starting with Frost. So I, like, I literally just downloaded Frost and I've got this in there. So the first thing you wanna do is change the themes folder name. Um, so my Theme name is going to be called Avalanche because we're going to stay in the same vein as the, the winter setup. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, I don't think you're allowed to start with new numerals and stuff like that. But um, so you want to change the theme folder name. That's the first thing, because at least then you could um, so you could duplicate Frost and then rename it. Or you could just put Frost in there and start um, from there. So changing the theme name is step number one. Um, step number two. Basically, these steps are walking you through like what is every file that has an instance or reference to Frost, right? Because like where where do I need to replace all of the Frost? So this is kind of what we're going to work through. Uh, so at the top of the style sheet is a header, which basically gives WordPress sort of the fundamental background of the entire theme. Obviously, you can see here theme name, like theme URI, author, and so on. Uh, and so what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to fork this live. Um, and I will zoom in so y'all can see. So I'm gonna go in here and basically scrub, uh, oops, scrub the Frost reference. I'm gonna do copy and pasting quickly. Um, pretend I own Avalanche WP, um, love WP Engine, but this is my project. So I'm just gonna 
pretend like this is my thing. So I would go through and just basically I'll, you could do the description. Uh, text domain is important if it's more of a product thing. This deals with localization. Um, so just making sure, and I'm going to do a quick search inside of the file to see if I missed any references of Frost. Yep. See, well, that's in the description. No big deal. Um, I would change that. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Strange that I submitted to WordPress.org yesterday, and I forgot to update a text domain in one string, and it kicked back and said, you've got two in there because I, I missed it. And so uh, Command F is your friend. Okay, so I've changed now everything at the top of the header. So between the theme folder name and just the references to Frost here, oops, uh, just in the spirit of being consistent and cover all, I'm gonna pretend that this is now my theme. So I will save that, which it's saving locally. So style sheet header is the next thing. Uh, I generally kind of go in like a certain order, style sheet, then functions, and then kind of everything inside. So inside of the functions file, which I'll get to, uh, there's lots of references of Frost. Function names being one of them, text domains being another. Um, and so what I would do is open up the functions file. I'll zoom in. Um, and if you, you can see here, there's all kinds of references. Now, some are uppercase, some are lowercase on purpose. I wouldn't necessarily do a search and replace because that from time to time can bite you uh, if there's an inadvertent replacement. Um, so uh, I won't go through all of them. Uh, so the function names typically are frost underscore something. So it's fairly safe to say, I don't know if you guys can see at the top here, I'm doing like a search and replace for all instances of frost underscore. So for instance, this function name, um, I'm gonna replace frost underscore with avalanche underscore, and I'm just gonna do like replace all of them. So it basically goes through and finds all of the function names and renames them from Frost to Avalanche. Uh, you'll be surprised at how many times I go into somebody's theme and you can tell that they've Googled and copied and pasted because you'll see 12 different function names in there. So they'll see like WPB underscore, I'm like, okay, you got that from WP Beginner. So you're, that's fine. But uh, a sophisticated builder would go in and just rename the file so that it's all consistent. Um, going back, so we've done the function names and there's probably some other references um, the description, I could change that. I'll save ourselves some time here. Uh, the link, okay, so here's the here's another uh, instance of the text domain. So right here, you can see Frost. That's a text domain used for localization. Uh, I'm going to replace that one. And then I'm just going to keep going through and searching so I make sure I replace all references. Uh, this function here enqueues the, the Frost style sheet. And inside of the... Uh, source code, it appends it like I think it's like frost dash style or dash CSS. Uh, and so I want to make sure that it now says avalanche. Uh, there are some more, let's see right there, powder. See, I missed one too. That should say frost. Uh, so I will replace, let me just scroll down here, do it the easy way. I'm just going to replace the instances of the text domains. And then I'll do another search. Okay, and so the last two references are just up here. That's just, I would normally change that, but to save time, I won't. So I've replaced everything in my functions file that refers to Frost with Avalanche. So now we're getting there. Uh, step four, and this is, in Frost, this is a little bit tedious. And one of the reasons why I'd say fork it, um, you wanna update the, the pattern file headers and the references too. So. What that means is at the top, and I'll open one here in a second, at the top of every pattern file is a, what, what's called a header. And this, similar to the style sheet, just gives a little more context to that pattern. Uh, and you can see here the slug says frost slash header default. What that means is this pattern is registered in the frost theme. So if you don't change this, all of a sudden, because you've changed the pattern or the folder already to avalanche, it's not going to, it's going to say incompatible. It's looking for frost, but it doesn't exist anymore because you've already renamed the theme folder. So for illustration purposes, I'll just pop open um, a couple, oops, wrong directory. So like, like I said, you should change them in every single one. And this is why I was like, I'm going to fork frost and just remove the ones I don't need. So I don't have to do this 35 times. Uh, so I'll just go into the header default file. 
zoom it in, you can see right here, there's a reference to frost. I'm gonna replace that with avalanche. So, and I would go through all the patterns I intend to keep. So that way, um, when a pattern is needing to be used or referenced, it all is part of the same theme then. It's not looking for something in frost. Uh, and you'll be surprised how many times like I skip some of these things inadvertently and I'm like, why is this thing not loading? And I'll go back and say, oh, I forgot to rename this. So, um, and so you update all the pattern file headers and the references too. There's a few instances, uh, for example, uh, template parts in a theme in Frost, the header and footer, basically those template parts look for the patterns that exist inside of Frost. And so here's another instance, let me zoom in where it's saying, okay, the footer should consist of this particular pattern in Frost, which is now named Avalanche. This footer will not load if I were to refresh my screen because it's trying to find the Frost folder. So another example of uh, replacing, and the header would be um, a similar example. And you'll get to learn, like themes aren't all that, there's not that many files in a theme. There are, but they're not really, and you, you start to understand where files are, how the, the file structure works and where all of these things need to be replaced. Um, so if you've done it once or twice or three times, all of a sudden it becomes second nature. Uh, before I get to five, Sam, were there any more questions? Yes, there is a question. Is it simpler to fork an FSC theme compared to a classic theme? Fundamentally about the same thing. Um, if you're going to fork any theme at this point, if you're capable of forking, I would suggest it's a great time to start working with full site editing anyways. Uh, a lot of hybrid themes out there might have limitations because of the way the themes were built. It's not a great like go forward plan anyways, only because so much has changed with WordPress. The limitations will be there. Um, if you insist for whatever reason, you need to stay within that sort of organizational structure of a theme, it's fine. It's about the same process. I, you know, people used to fork Genesis child themes all the time. I mean, half the theme shops that were built on Genesis were basically forks of themes that we had, and that's fine. And that was the intent. Um, and I know that because I would buy some themes and then see our function names in them that were not renamed. Um, so things like that. It's the same process basically. But again, if you're into forking and you're trying to build a base theme for your business going forward, I would say as part of the process, really invest into full site editing because there's so much more to it. The advantages are, are better. It helps expedite um, building process and things like that. So that would be my answer. There's another workflow related question, which says, would it be wise to move all theme patterns into a plugin while forking it? If you don't want to lose them, sure. Um, I, you don't even need to make them into a plugin necessarily at that point. Uh, the way the pattern, it, it's really all just all files in a patterns directory. It's like I just leave them there and you could literally just disconnect that pattern directory if you leave a, like the header and the footer and like the couple of ones that are required for just the theme to function. Um, I don't know that I would put them into a plugin because I think um, the, the, the way, and this was before WordPress implemented sort of this pattern scanning sort of technology in, in, uh, full site editing is that there was a different way to register patterns in a plugin. You had to do it through like a functions file. And it, it was a different methodology that was a little more clunky. And then WordPress, uh, basically implemented code that says, Hey, just see if a theme has a patterns directory. And if those PHP files are there, load them. So it's a lot of extra work. I would just say, if anything, just take the ones you don't want, stick them locally somewhere, like in like a sort of temporary hold folder, and then bring them back in if you need them. Um, like if you're afraid to lose them or something like that. No other questions. There was just a call out um, in the chat that I think would be helpful to mention. Uh, there's a there's the create block theme plugin, which allows you to clone and rename and do some of those like uh, renaming steps. I haven't obviously used that, but, and I don't know if you have either, Brian, but that was mentioned in the chat. Yeah, I was actually, and th that's a good call out because I meant to say at the beginning of this presentation, similar to the many ways to WordPress, 
Uh, there are different ways to fork a theme, and that was going to be my call out. Uh, this is the manual way, which I typically always do, um, for better or worse. Uh, but the Create Black Theme plugin really leans into sort of what I talked about earlier with WordPress and the ability to build anything in the back end. Um, so an example in this case, and if somebody has it handy, Microsam or somebody, uh, the Create Black Theme, either the GitHub repo or the uh, plugin URL on the repository, uh, the Create Black Theme plugin basically allows you to take a theme, load it on a site, and through the site editor in the back end, make all kinds of changes. You could literally build a sophisticated theme with all kinds of color schemes and different layouts and 20 different page templates and at some point maybe a, a pattern library uh, and then with one click basically export that as a new theme there's probably some gotchas in there that like it doesn't search and replace like every instance i don't know if you can rename a theme and have it sort of extrapolate throughout it may allow you to rename the theme i don't know for sure because they've done several updates recently like you can call the theme name something else, but then you still have to go in and make all of the changes if you're going to use it as a true base theme. Um, but that plugin is great for people who are a little on, little more on the no code side uh, of things. Perfect. I don't see any other questions right now. Cool. So after going through uh, style sheet header functions and things like that, we're just kind of like renaming everything sort of inside of all of the theme files. Now's your time to sort of make it your own, right? What makes this now different other than just a different name change? And so I won't go through the hassle of like rebuilding and redesigning all kinds of things, but I do want to, for fun, uh, go into my new Avalanche theme. Uh, and just to sort of demonstrate how this works, I'm going to go into the theme JSON file, zoom in. Uh, and in the spirit of just showing off, I'm going to, I'm going to say, you know, like Brian, you're cute and blue is great and all that kind of stuff, but um, I'm a purple guy. So my base theme avalanche is going to be a purple themed thing. Uh, so I'm going to, I think 6600 CC is the right color. So I'm going to just change the primary color in the palette from blue to purple. And so what this does is every instance that uh, references the blue that's in frost, the patterns or whatever, uh, will now become purple, assuming it's using the CSS variable that gets output from this, this primary color. And so uh, so I've just changed that in my theme avalanche that's that I forked. Uh, and in the spirit of making sure this works the way I expect, this here is my new avalanche demo on local. Uh, it originally started with the frost theme. Remember, I renamed it to avalanche and then went through and kind of updated all the references. And assuming I didn't miss anything, if I refresh my screen, all instances of blue should become purple. So, nope, see. The theme directory frost does not exist. Oh, I know why. Dumb. Uh, so because I renamed the theme, it was still looking for frost because frost was active. So I've renamed the theme to avalanche. Uh, and so now I got to go back and activate avalanche. So this is the screenshot. I'll get to this in a second. Uh, so hopefully now, there we go. So now it's got the, the new avalanche theme loaded. Uh, that's the way WordPress works. If you change a theme name, it can't track that. It still tries to load Frost. And so that's why we got the error. Um, so this is Avalanche. Now you can see all instances of blue became purple. And so that's how that works. So the long version is you can go in, you can, you know, change your fonts through theme JSON. You can, you know, like I, I think Mike uses enter in his themes or fig tree. Like if there's a different Google font you'd like, I'm, sort of an outfit fan, but I realize other people want to use different things. That's where you take your base theme and say, my base theme avalanche is going to be using enter. So I go in and I replace the, 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 the font files and stuff like that. I change the colors. I change the spacing. I change everything that's inside of theme JSON. Maybe I add patterns or remove patterns. Uh, and so, um, this is kind of what step five is. This is your ability to go in and basically make it your own. Like you can literally go into uh, this is the theme folder. You can say, I know for a fact, I do not want any, any of these patterns. Like you could just literally delete them from your theme. That's what I did with powder. There's probably four or five patterns that have to exist because they're part of the template structure that make up the theme. Like the 404 pattern is sitting in the, the 404 template, um, itself. So that actually needs to stay header footer and query, I think are the other ones. 
um, that should stay. So you could technically, um, well, just for the sake of demonstrating. So this is the, the patterns directory and the powder base theme. It basically, it's completely like wiped out uh, other than the few things that it needs to have. Uh, so this is why for the question earlier, something like powder, like this does the work for you, right? Like it's like, it's stripped down already. So again, this is your chance to sort of make the theme your own in the way Bob Ross would paint a painting. Uh, last but not least, uh, updating the theme screenshot. Uh, every theme has a screenshot that's required right here. You can see inside of powder, it's that inside of frost would look like this. Uh, you literally just need to just replace that. It's, you know, one of those things that some people forget and you're like, activate a theme that's avalanche, but you see the frost screenshot doesn't make a good look. So, uh, I would just update the theme screenshot as well. 1200 by 900, uh, is one of the last steps. Um, Hey, Brian, can we, uh, actually this is this, this question <laughs> will be relevant right here to step seven. So you might yep. get to this anyway. Um, how do we determine what's required? Like what can't you delete what's oh. required when you fork? Okay. Uh, so yes, st step seven, uh, and this is, uh, showing my age in a reference to stand by me for those who've seen the, the scene, uh, the yakety yak reference, take out the papers in the trash. Um, this is where you can just go in and remove things you don't need. So that being said, let me clear out of all of these files. Uh, and this is just good to sort of poke around with anyways and understand how things work. Uh, I'm going to go into the templates. Uh, I'm going to go into archive PHP, or <laughs> that's the old way of doing things, uh, archive um, HTML. And if you, let me zoom in, certain templates, uh, pull in the pattern uh, like this. So this template, this is the archive template. It's wrapped in like groups and some other things that make up part of the template. Um, but the query part of this archive file uh, is placed into a pattern. Obviously, Frost, we would re rename that Avalanche uh, as well, because otherwise it won't know to look. Like if I went to like the archive page, it would basically load nothing at that point because it was still trying to find the frost version. Uh, so this is a pattern that needs to exist, the query pattern. So going back into the patterns directory, uh, this is the query. And this is all the markup that makes like the blocks that make up the query pattern. Uh, similarly, let me zoom in. You would want to change frost to avalanche here. Um, and this is all necessary. And the reason it's done this way is that uh, there are several files, archive, search, index that are basically the same thing. Uh, and similarly, in the spirit of consolidating, if they all reference one source code, like this query pattern, you don't have to update this um, in every file. Now, technically, you could take this code and do this, which is replacing the reference to the query pattern with just all the code that's in it. But you'd have to do this across multiple files and the spirit of trying to recycle, this is the way I've chosen to do it. Um, so often the, the short answer to the question is like, if you delete some things and you like go to load something and something breaks, then you realize, then you have to figure out what you've done. So a lot of times I, I recommend this often when you're doing stuff like this is do a thing, like refresh your screen, make sure nothing breaks because it's easier to sort of breadcrumb that way. Because if like you've committed like 30 changes and something's broken, you're like, okay, well, which of the 30 broke it? So I often do that where like, I'll just, you know, grab things, delete them, just kind of click through my site, make sure it still works and functions. That's a pretty safe indicator that you've deleted something that's not necessary. Awesome. We're getting lots of comments and feedback in the chat, by the way, just conversations about create block theme versus mm -hmm. like this way of doing it. And I think that seeing seeing what is actually changing versus just clicking a button is very helpful. Um, okay. So am I doing that properly? <laughs> like, yeah, you're doing, no, oh, okay. Okay. That's what I'm saying. You're showing, <laughs> okay. you're showing the under the hood, you're showing what's actually happening behind the scenes. So we Got know it. what's, you know, what's being changed. So thank you. Yeah. And go ahead. And if there's any other comments or questions, I'm trying to think through if there's anything sort of like, like lat, like things else that you would else would want to purge um, the assets directory in a theme. 
um, in Frost, uh, several patterns have images that are kind of housed by the theme. If you're deleting patterns that you know have images or you're deleting everything, uh, you could probably safely uh, delete this images folder because all this does is load the images that are associated with those patterns. And so if you don't need the patterns, you don't need the images that go with them. Uh, fonts you want to keep because this is what loads the font. This is what houses the font files that are used in the theme. Uh, so you'd want to keep that. Um, template parts, like if you, you're building a thing and you're never going to have comments, you can pull the comments template part out. Um, similarly, in the single file, uh, there's a reference to that template part here, which basically loads the comment, the whole comments form block, the whole thing. Like if you said, I'm building a thing, we're going to never have comments because I don't believe in blogs anymore. Um, you would just need to kind of know where to delete each thing. Um, so you sort of delete the instance, the reference of it here in single, then you go back and delete like kind of what that pulls in. So it's like a two-part thing. Any questions? Nope, Sam? nothing else. Okay, I'm just thinking through. Um, so Frost has a couple of, we'll call them custom templates. Um, the ones you see here, I don't know if I can zoom in on this. No, I can't. Uh, the ones you see here are very typical of like the, a WordPress theme hierarchy. You've got like a 404 file, an index file, which is basically like the blog page when you load something up. There's a search file, there's a single file, a, a standard page, and we've got a couple here called uh, no title and blank. Uh, these are just files that exist. Like blank is literally like a blank screen. So like if you wanted to like build a landing page without having to deal with headers and footers and all of that, that file is used. Uh, so in, in, in a case, if you're like trying to strip things out, um, you know, blank and no title could be files that you remove. Uh, you can, re so if you remove the templates, uh, like I said, in theme JSON at the top, this is where you, um, tell WordPress, Hey, I've got some custom templates that are registered with my theme. This is what they should be called and how they should look in the dropdown menu in the admin. And so you remove the templates, you got to remove this piece of code also, because this is sort of tied with it. Um, readme text, like if you're not going to put this theme up on the, the theme directory, like you could delete the readme text. Really, all that does is, you know, things that are like required for WordPress.org's theme submission process. Um, so that could be something you ditch. Uh, screenshot you need, theme JSON you need, style sheet you need. Uh, oh, here's a so uh, Frost has. Let me pop open a new tab. And this is I did not actually include this. Uh, it, last minute, so Frost has seven different theme variations. So in this case, the theme variations are just by color. Literally, just an extra theme JSON file that has different primary colors uh, defined. And so if you're trying to strip it down to its basics, you would say, we don't need that. Uh, we just want to roll with like the default that comes with the theme. Then all you have to do is this entire directory. Like I said, each one, um, let me just to show people how this works. Uh, if you have a styles directory and there's JSON file inside of it, it will recognize this as an available variation. Like I said, in this case, all it did was just sort of redefine the palette with like the color. Uh, you could 86 that entire directory literally by just selecting styles and just deleting the whole folder. Okay, there is so, a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to read out what it says. Theoretically, could you copy patterns from a different third-party theme and add it to the pattern directory, change the namespace, and use it? thinking this through, I would say there's a 80% chance that it will come through and as expected. Um, as we talked earlier, many ways to WordPress, what I would actually consider doing is adding it into, uh, and this is a good plug for Pattern Manager, one of our products at WP Engine, uh, where you can put it into the editor, manipulate it, and then export it out. Uh, and it'll do all the things you need it to. Um, I don't think like if I downloaded, 
I don't know, one of Rich Tabor's themes and just like copied his pattern directory and dumped it in into Avalanche and then just renamed it at the top. There's probably some nuances there, um, mainly around references to um, things that are defined in theme JSON. Like maybe his his primary color palette is a different color or he he defines his um, colors differently or the, the font sizes or the spacing sizes in a different sort of format. Cause in WordPress, it's not necessarily like uniform. Like he may, instead of calling things primary, secondary and tertiary call them color one and two and three. And so if you copy his patterns over and those patterns have references to color one, two and three, your theme's not going to know what to do with it. So I would say, I wouldn't suggest doing that. Cause I think you're going to cause more problems than, um, it'd probably be easier to rebuild the pattern itself. <laughs> you know, using your theme, visually looking at what it is, and then just sort of exporting that into its own file. It's a good question, though, because it because a lot of people just don't know that there's some nuances there that might be um, problematic. Great, thanks. I don't see any other questions. Well, I have one more slide. This is a fun one. Um, what do you do with it, right? You fork a theme, then what? Um, you build something cool, you give it back to the community, or you use it for a client site. These are like the three three reasons at the end of the day why somebody would fork something. Um, and of course, this is my fun screenshot of powder. I've built this with the powder base theme, and you can see this is those are that's a child theme example. Um but that's what the open source is for, right? To, to use it, to be inspired by it, to build something cool with it. Um, Jeremy Techman, I don't think he's on this call, but he's part of build mode. He's there often. He forked Frost. He built his own theme called Monk. You know, he's doing his own thing with it. He's going to essentially use that for client sites. Maybe he sells the theme. That's totally okay. Uh, the good look is to make sure there's no references to Frost in there so that it's like a full packaged, uh, legit deal. Um, there you go. Perfect. You give it back. You know, like I said, I got started in WordPress because I forked a free theme that was available. Uh, granted, the formatting of that theme and the spacing made my OCD completely go crazy. Uh, so the first thing I did before I even changed the name was just went through and formatted it and indented and made it all perfect. Then I changed the name. Then I evolved it into something else. Uh, there is a downside, or we'll call it the dark side of forking, which is literally taking something, changing the name, and then selling it as your own. It's legal within the, the GPL, uh, people try to do it. It's not really the spirit. The spirit is to take something built on top of it and make it your own. Um, so that's sort of the give back, like, you know, download a theme, make it your own, put it back on the repository for the next person to, to use um, or to use it for a client site. Again, if I had an agency, I would without a doubt have a base theme I started with. It wouldn't necessarily always be like, a base and child theme situation, but I would always start with the same thing because I know it, it's slim, it's as light as it could be. Um, and I would use something like that um, for every client site I build. I want to build something cool. So that's my answer. Any other questions? In the meantime, uh, if they're, uh, if savvy, savvy people will say, I'm going to fork frost and I'm going to call it summit or Aspen or something, and I'm going to sell it and make a whole bunch of money off you. That's exactly what you should do. That's part of the spirit. Uh, just change all references to frost and do something that makes it your own. It's a good look, but, um, trying to think, do you feel like you know how to fork a theme? Oh, that's a great. I do. I think I know how to fork a theme. I don't own it anymore, but I felt so strongly about this. Uh, at one point, I registered the domain name Fork Frost and was just going to just redirect it. So I could tell people on a, a webinar or something like this, just go to forkfrost.com and go get it. Immediate download. Christopher, you're the only one that is on video. So like I keep seeing you and, and you're smiling and I know you're waiting to get a call so we could talk about how to build your little framework. I know you've evolved your business a little bit, but um, for people who are doing niche things, something like this is like truly the way to go. Um, you know, building your own 
sort of foundation, extending upon that, making it, you know, whether it's your own set of custom blocks, uh, similar to what Mike did back in the day with atomic blocks, things that are particular to a niche, like maybe you're like churchblocks.com or something like that, right? You've got your church framework, you've got your church functionality built in, you know, all of a sudden you're the go-to church website builder for people who are interested in using WordPress. So exactly. No, yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. <laughs> so um, and pairing it with a course on how to write their content to put in it. So. Yes, 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 yes. Chat GPT, that's how you do it. I did not say that. Let's see, there is a question from Justin. It says, yes. what types of changes or updates will be happening for Frost down the road? If you have any. Uh, great question. Uh, with WordPress 6.2, I really tried to get Frost like level set with everything that that offers, knowing that it was going to go on the directory and that it was going to become not an experimental theme anymore. Uh, when you When you say it's an experimental thing, you can do things that just sort of not necessarily introduce breaking changes, but it's just easier to just add new things and do updates. And so there's a consideration um, that has to be made when you have a theme on the directory because the auto update feature exists. In fact, Frost has that same caveat if and when that makes its way. Technically, anybody who downloaded 0.1 two years ago will get the update notice and that might present its own set of challenges. Um, generally speaking, from this point forward, people who grab Frost, uh, it should be good. Uh, one of the great things about WordPress now is that most of the changes that happen uh, when you're playing around in the back end uh, through the site editor and all of that global styles, those changes get saved to the database. So when Frost, the theme itself updates, the files generally won't affect the presentation of a website because anything that was customized happens less in the file structure and more in the database. So it's protected. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, if you fork a theme like Frost, but you leave it Frost, you make a whole bunch of changes, but you forget to change the theme name and you get prompted for an update and that auto update will wipe out your changes because that's how it works. Um, so another another reason to, to make sure you grab a name that doesn't have um, a theme already on the directory, even if it's a different theme, if it's the same name, um, you may get someone else's theme over the top of yours. There's one last question because I know we're about at time. Yep. Um, but Mike said, I feel a bit of FOMO to fr fork Frost, especially when under active development, but 1.0 feels like a better time to do this. Your recommendation is just to keep eyes on the GitHub repo to stay on top of changes, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it, it's a great call out and why the alignment, Mike, on this, the 6.2, the submission, this workshop, uh, because what version 1.0 does is it removes our experimental tag and basically makes people feel like it's a stable. I mean, it always has been because it's been tested and worked with for obsessively by me, probably more hours than I care to admit. Um, but moving forward, anything that gets added to Frost, I know what to think through as far as will this change affect or break a site. And uh, generally speaking, the answer is going to be no, it won't. And we're probably, if anything, just looking at um, two two different things that are going to be sort of changing or updates. One is the addition of new patterns. So that won't break a site because all it does is it adds more in the library for people to choose from. Uh, it doesn't affect anything that's already been inserted into a client site or anything like that. Uh, and then the other thing is probably just changing in methodologies of how things are done or registered. In other words, like if there's a harder way to do it now that gets replaced by an easier way, that also won't be a fundamental like breaking of a site because it's just changing the way in which it's wired, uh, if that makes sense. So, or just adding extra settings that WordPress sort of moves out with, um, you know, support for borders on a certain block or whatever. Like these are things that won't break sites. So, uh, I will not change theme names. I will not like completely reorg template files and things like that at this point because that's the kind of thing that would break a site. So or alter the way it looks. I did want to call out too that, and I just put this in the chat, uh, Build Mode Live this week, we're focusing on like an Ask Me Anything with, with Brian about Frost 1.0. Uh, so that's something that, you know, we can continue those conversations there as well. Yes. 
And for those who missed the first workshop, this entire um, presentation that you saw was built using just the Frost theme and a blank page template. Uh, you know, I had to sort of hard code these navigation links, but this is all just a, you know, frost.local slash slide slash page name. So kind of a fun fun way to use WordPress. I know Nick, Nick Diego uh, did a presentation at WordCamp US, I think, uh, similar fashion where he used his theme to to do the presentation. So unless there are any other questions, that was the extent of what I was looking to present. We're going to do more Frost things. Uh, the Frost website is always the best place to look at like what's new or what's coming or, you know, the addition or, or just how things work. Um, and uh, Sam, can you grab my Twitter since I don't have my, my bookmarks yep. handy? Um, feel free to to follow me or to reach out on Twitter. If you want to set up a time, like a one-on-one, -on -one, I can give you a calendar link um, to, uh, to just to dig deeper. Like, Hey, I like this idea. I have this idea of what I want to do. Can you help me just like think through in the execution of it? Uh, it's why we exist our team here at WP engines. So we are here to serve, uh, you are not putting us out by scheduling a one-on-one. -on -one, so feel free to do that. Or if you, if I glossed over something or missed something you thought I should have had, uh, feel free to just, um, reach out on Twitter, send me a DM, say, Hey, would love the one-on-one -on -one link. So I could ask my question. Uh, feel free to do that. That would be great. Um, but otherwise, uh, I appreciate everybody being here. As you could tell, uh, I love WordPress. I love Frost. I love people. This is like my sweet spot, and I enjoy helping people um, pursue their dreams as I was able to pursue mine from the same process. So, that being said, I will. Uh, Stop sharing my screen. I will hang on Zoom for a few extra minutes, just kind of for uh, random questions or anything like that. But this is sort of the extent of the presentation. Again, thank you for being here. Build mode happens every Friday, 10 o'clock Central. Uh, Sam and I are always, and many of you are here for that. And we talk about WordPress and just creative ways to use it, how to make it better for our business and so on. So it's a great resource uh, for anybody interested.